All right, so uh, back in March, before the, this pandemic, uh, we were doing a series on Galatians, and Chris had started it off, and then Pastor had, uh, continued on that, and then, of course, I was supposed to come in. I think Pastor did two of them, and I was supposed to come in and share my, my part of it. And so we're going we're gonna to look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 21. And Rosemary put, you know, she put that whole passage in the bulletin, but I'm kind of, I don't read right through it. I'm going to read like the first few verses and then kind of talk and then go on. And so you can follow along. It's in there, you know, if you want to use it for your reference. Uh, some of my translations may be a little different at times. But, um, but anyway, uh, if you remember where we left off is um, the Galatians um, responded to the gospel. And uh, they grew in their faith, and they had a close relationship with Paul. And for some unknown reason, after receiving their freedom in Christ, they took a turn back to bondage. And, um, and they started following the regulations of the old Mosaic law, the, the law. And we heard Pastor, if you can remember back then, where he kind of left off, where he had referred to the Jews uh, to Jews that were still living under the law were as if they were uh, still slaves, and that the law was external, not eternal. The law was external and not eternal. And that Paul was saying the law was fulfilled by Christ, and they didn't need it, they didn't need it anymore. So Paul says in chapter 2, uh, verses 29, uh, uh, going back to that, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 19 and 21. He says in the New King James Version of it, For I thought the law died, no, I'm sorry, For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. This is small print. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And I always like to look at different versions, because some of them may explain a little easier or may give a different insight to it, but it's all the same meaning. And uh, I, I, another version I liked in the New Living Translation uh, version is, for when I tried to keep the law, I realized I could never gain God's approval. So I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I live my life in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who, lived, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not one of those who treats the grace of God as meaningless. And I like this. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, then there was no need for Christ to die. I like how that translation gives it. But Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28-30, He says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke fits perfectly, and the burden I give you is light. That sounds a lot easier, right? Sounds a lot easier. And, and so why turn back? Why turn back to living as a slave? And we live at the beach here in Cape May, and I know we have these whale watching boats and, and uh, you can go out and watch the dolphins and, and I'm a Navy guy so I saw many whales out in the ocean and they're amazing to even watch even if you're watching them on a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a television show. Um, they're impressive. They're an insp inspiration with their strength and their majesty and freedom. But tragically, uh, with their immense size, they, they become trapped when they, when they come too close to shore. And uh, for, the, for the beached whale, the strength and freedom that they had in the open water is gone. 
It's gone. A beached whale is a horrible sight, and the freedom the whale enjoyed in the open water vanished as the whale becomes enslaved by the sandbar. And there, you know, we've seen it uh, numerous times, maybe on the news, but there, there was a situation where, where beached whales were rescued. And uh, teams of people kept the whales wet while others worked to get the whales free from the sandbar that would cause their certain death if something were not done to help them. And once they became free, they could return to the open water. The rescue worked. And now the, free, now the free whales returned again to the deep water to enjoy their freedom. But for some unknown reason, one whale turned around and headed back for the sandbar and became beached again. Why? No one knows why this whale would turn to the sandbar and be enslaved again as a beached whale. In the book of Galatians, we find that Paul is uh, perplexed. Paul is perplexed. He loves the Galatian believers and they have done something as perplexing as the whale that was freed from the sandbar but then would return to the sandbar again as a beached whale and become enslaved by the sandbar. The Galatians were living um, uh, in spiritual bondage. They were living in spiritual bondage. And but by the grace of God, Paul visited that region and told them about salvation in Christ. Paul ministered in Galatia in all three of his missionary journeys. And they responded to the gospel again, and they grew in their faith, and they had a close relationship with Paul. But for some unknown reason, for, after receiving their freedom in Christ, they took a turn back to bondage. They started following the regulations of the law. They came to Christ by grace, but they were deceived to think that they must continue by works and merit. Their relationship with Paul was fractured, and their joy was lost, and they found themselves back in spiritual bondage, like that whale again headed back to the sandbar. And Paul pleads with them. He pleads with them not to continue in that spiritual bondage. How many of us know somebody like that? And they respond to the gospel in their faith, and you have a close relationship with them, and they seem to, and, and then they seem to lose focus and forget about the, you know, if we look at Ephesians chapter two and, and, and the verse eight, which says, "For the for by the grace for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not by yourselves, because it's a gift from God." How many of us uh, know somebody like that? I know some, but let me ask you a question: Do you plead with them not to continue in spiritual bondage as Paul did? How many of us have done that? So why turn back? Why turn back? Why would whales with freedom turn back to the sandbar and get themselves beached again? Why would a butterfly, why would a butterfly with the freedom of flight want to return to crawling around as a caterpillar again? Paul has been tough with the Galatians, and he, sta he, he started his letter by calling them foolish. If you remember, Chris started this off, and he said, you foolish Galatians. You foolish Galatians, Paul said. He has been scholarly, too, reasoning with them in a deeply theological way. See, these new Christians that Paul was addressing were being lured by other missionaries to add the observances of the Jewish law, like circumcision, circumcision as a means of salvation. Another way to look at this is that these Galatians seem to be repeating the error of the wilderness generation in Exodus. They seem to be repeating the wilderness uh, uh, generation in Exodus. The error. When Moses ascended the mountain, the Israelites had just been liberated from Egypt, but they fashioned and worshipped the golden calf and they turned aside from the Lord. They departed from the Lord shortly after being delivered. 
They even accused Paul or undermined his authority, stating that he had not been trained by Jesus himself. Even though Paul has been commissioned by Christ himself to take the good news of salvation by faith in Christ, not by works to the non-Jewish world. That his gospel did not agree with that of the original and true apostles of Jerusalem. That he had kept from his converts in Galatia the the necessity of accepting circumcision and other key obligations of the Jewish law in order to be more easily to order more easily win them to Christ. Now he becomes tender. We see his pastoral heart here in these verses that we're going to read. He reminisces about their formerly close relationship and calls them back to living in spiritual uh, to to living in spiritual freedom. And we see him express his deep compassion in these verses. So we're going to look, we're going to, I'm going to read to you from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, which says, Before you Galatians knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that, no one even ex- that, that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spirit? spiritual principles of this world. You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or or, or seasons or years. And he says, I fear for you. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. And in the Old Testament, we we read and wonder why Israel would, would get freedom from Egypt and want to return to slavery again. Why would the Galatians uh, of the first century with freedom in Christ want to turn back to the regulations of the law? And why would a Christian today, saved by grace, want to return back to bondage? It is perplexing, and it makes no sense. Paul is perplexed because what they have done is so foolish. What they have done is so foolish. Formerly, the Galatians lived as slaves in spiritual bondage. The Galatians worshipped false gods. In Acts um, 14, 8 through 20, we read that Paul healed a crippled man in in this region. It attracted a crowd, and the Galatians mistakenly thought that Paul was a god who had come down in human form. And they called, uh, they called Barnabas, they called Barnabas Zeus, and they thought Paul was the god Hermes. The crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to them, but Paul called them to turn from these worthless things to the living God. And they were, they were, they were saved, and he told them in Galatians 3.9, now you know God. Now you know God. And they experienced their relationship with the living God, And Paul rephrases his statement to be more technically correct and says, rather now you are known by God. You are known by God. And this better describes their relationship with God. Not to allow the impression that they earned their salvation or merited it. So your salvation, my salvation, is God's initiative. Uh, You did worship dead idols in the past, but now you worship the living and true God. So why turn back? How can we understand it when someone who responds to God gives evidence of repentance and faith, then is baptized as a testimony, and then turns back? It's perplexing. Paul knew the weight of ministry Paul knew the weight of ministry. He was anguished over his own people who were lost. He was anguished for those he ministered to and who were now shipwrecked in their faith. And I see that happening to us sometimes. When we, again, when we see somebody that we that are that that are they're accepting the the gospel, uh, growing in their faith, and then turn away, it's perplexing and it's also 
uh, anguishing. It's, it's, it hurts. It's more of a hurt, uh, a sadness. We know this anguish all too well. We know all this, this anguish all too well. If you look around, and you know, it's understandable with, with COVID-19, and there are, there are folks that, that are not comfortable to yet as to come back into the building or, or you know, to be in, a, in public places. And, and we understand that, and we also know that those folks uh, that, that are watching us on multimedia and using technology, uh, wherever they may be, but on any given Sunday prior to this epidemic uh, or in the, in the future, you look around, and especially if you're up here, you look around and you say, where is so-and-so? Where is so-and-so? They're not in church. Did they turn back to swim into the sandbar and, and beat themselves? Have they exchanged freedom for slavery? It hurts when this happens. It should hurt you when this happens, when you look next to you, to your left or your right, behind you, in front of you, and those that are not here for, for apparently no reason. It should hurt you. Don't ask me to explain why this happens, and, 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 and don't ask me to, to, to take it lightly. When Paul, what Paul is displaying here is the pastor's heart. The pastor's heart. Part of being a Christian, a Christian leader, is to know anguish when you, you saw someone who knew the joy and freedom in Christ turn back to spiritual slavery. And some of them are in our own families. Sometimes in ministry you find yourself emotionally down and perplexed. This comes with the, the territory of having compassion. If people, do not accept, if people do not respond to Christ, it can tear you up especially those that you love. It can tear you up. And when people turn back to spiritual slavery, it's agonizing. It's not right to get bitter about it, but it's not wrong to be anguished and over, um, over spiritual casualties. The Galatians... The Galatians were in bondage to the Old Testament law. They, they started observing special days and months and seasons and years. And today some Christians return to bondage of the world system. It's, it is returning to spiritual slavery. Paul just felt like everything he had done there had become wasted efforts if they remained under the influence of the Judaizers. Maybe he had it, I'm sorry. Maybe he had in mind the time he laid there on the ground in Galatia after people threw rocks at him until they finally left him for dead. That effort now seemed in vain. I imagine it was exciting for him to see Galatian ministry expand and then heart wrenching, heart wrenching to see it slipping away. And he has a compassionate plea. Paul leaves deep theology behind. It's like you have been talking to a friend who wrecked their life by a foolish decision. If we read Galatians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, he says, I plead with you, brothers. I plead with you, brothers. Become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. And as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even through my illness, even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. And said, instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus Himself. What has happened to all your joy? What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy? Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? He pleaded with them. He, was, he, he has laid out the logical arguments why they should not go back to a system of works 
And, how, and now he pleads with them, don't do it. Don't do it. I care too much for you to sit by and see you do this. How many of us know somebody like that? Family members. Be, and he says, become like me with freedom in Christ. Paul spoke of identity. He became like them. He became all things to all men to make them like him, having freedom in Christ. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it kind of sums it up like this. It kind of sums it like this. Adapt as much as you can. And this isn't the word in. But adapt as much as you can in non-sinful ways to win people to Christ. Make sense? Adapt as much as you can in non-sinful ways to win people to Christ. Be truthful about the Gospel. And be bold and pray about it. Pray for words. Paul also reminds them of the relationship they previously had. They would in, in, in the past do anything for him. And I can testify that, that says that if you could have done so, you would, have not, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me, he said. Those who are back in bondage no longer feel close to those walking closely with Christ. Have you noticed that? The truth becomes offensive. The truth becomes offensive. And Paul asked them, what happened to your joy? What happened to your joy? They have lost that spring in their step. There is no longer a song in their heart. They made the great exchange originally trading their bondage for freedom. Now how could they exchange back for the bondage? Why go back to spiritual slavery? Paul has a purpose. He, there's, a, there's a need for the right purpose. Paul talks about religious zeal. It can be good or it can be bad dependent on the purpose. Paul himself is a very zealous, zealous man. He's extremely fervent in his faith. Zeal is good with the right direction and for a good purpose. Some people can have a misguided zeal. The Judaizers who shipwrecked the Galatians were misguided like that. Those uh, in Galatians 4, <clears throat> 4, 17 through uh, 20, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is uh, to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so, and to be so always and not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Paul spoke to the believers in Galatia who had, had strayed as uh, my dear children. He compares his anguish for them to, a, to, to a, a delivering mother's labor pains to bring forth a child. And for a mother, the child is born and she forgets the pain. He went through much pain to take the gospel to them, and he could not forget the pain. It was again a time of emotional pain as he writes to exhort them back to the right spiritual path. But if he could see them get right in their walk and the Lord again, all the pain would be all worth it. Folks, like Paul, you may have to deal with those who turn back. It's all too common. And Paul's example was to use appeal onto them with several different approaches. He was tough. We called them foolish. He was deeply theological and explained in detail their error. And in this passage, he makes a passionate appeal. He preaches the gospel with deep, heartfelt compassion. And we need this kind of concern for the lost. And for those who, have, who, who leave the freedom of Christ and return to the yoke of slavery. 
So I'm asking you if you just keep the faith and don't turn back. You have known the spiritual liberty and walk in it and live in it. And as the very first uh, verse in chapter 5 uh, says, Christ has already set us free. Now make sure you stay free and don't get tied up in slavery to the law. Will you pray with me? You know, Lord, as believers, as believers, we know where true hope is found. We are incredibly grateful for the love and forgiveness uh, that you give us. We have been set free and redeemed for your purposes. And yet, as most of us know so very well, so very well, not everyone shares or desires it, or they, they, they not everyone desires to walk close and stay connected to you, God. You know, which often leaves us um, with an ache, with an ache deep inside. And the truth is that many are still lost, wandering and searching and, or drifting farther away from you. So God, we ask that you would stop every pain or every plan. We, we ask that you would stop every plan of the enemy over those we love as we bring them before you right now. We pray that you demolish his schemes and that your plans for good, for a future, and hope will prevail. Open up our eyes. Open up eyes that they may see their, uh, your truth. And we pray for a miraculous intervention of your spirit to draw them close to you, Lord. Again, Lord, we just thank you uh, for this day. We pray lessons of health and, and uh, joy through suffering uh, for everyone here today. In Jesus' name, amen.